Hello, hello, and welcome to the Morgan Library. My name is Miss Lindsay, and welcome to Teen Talk Tuesday. Now, the book I'll be reading today is called The Downstairs Girl by Stacy Lee. Here we go. <clears throat> the Downstairs Girl. Chapter One. Being nice is like leaving your door wide open. Eventually, someone's going to mosey in and steal your best hat. Me? I have only one hat, and it's uglier than a smashed crow. So if someone stole it, the joke would be on their head. Literally. Still, boundaries must be set, especially boundaries over one's worth. Today, I will demand a raise. You're making that pavement twitchy the way you're staring at it, Robbie Withers shines his smile on me. Ever since the traveling dentist who pulled Robbie's rotting molar told him he would lose more if he didn't scrub his teeth regularly, he has brushed twice daily, and he expects me to do it too. Pavement is underappreciated for all it does to smooth the way, I tell his laughing eyes, which are brown like eagle's feathers, same as his skin. We should be more grateful. Robbie gestures grandly at the ground. Pavement! We're much obliged, despite all the patty cakes we dump on you. He pulls me away from the pile of manure. It was Robbie's mother who nursed me when I was a baby. God rest her soul. And it was she who told old Jin about the secret basement under the print shop. Whitehall Street, the spine of Atlanta, rises well above the treetops with her stately brick and imposing stone buildings along with the occasional Victorian house that refuses to give up her seat at the table. Business is good here, and like the long-leaf pine forest, being burned at Sherman's troops a quarter century ago only made the city grow back stronger. You look different today. I pretend to appraise him for his cap to his tan trousers. You forget something? It is rare to see him without the mule and cart he uses as a delivery man for Bucksbaum's department store. They're down a clerk, Mr. Buxbaum's letting me fill in until they find someone new. He strains his pinstrip jacket, though it's already straight enough to measure it. You don't say. Mr. Buxbaum is popular among whites and colored alike, but hiring a colored clerk isn't done in these parts. If I do a good job, maybe he'll let me fill in on a more permanent basis. He gives me a tight smile. If you don't stick your foot out, you'll never advance. You'd be perfect for the job. I myself am fixing to ask Mrs. English for a raise. He whistles a short, low sound. <whistles> if Mrs. English had any sense, she'd give it to you. Of course, common sense was never very common in these parts. I nod, a surge of righteous blood flowing my veins. Two years I have worked as a milliner's assistant at the same wage of 50 cents a day. Measly, it is already 1890. Plus, old Jin has lost too much weight. And I need to buy him medicine, not a booty ball or buckeye powder, but something legitimate. And legitimate costs money. <laughs> One of the newly electric streetcars approaches, bringing by an audience of Southerners in various stages of confusion at the sight of me. An eastern face in western clothes always sets the game wheels to spinning between curiosity and disapproval. Most of the time, the corner lands on disapproval. I should charge them for the privilege of ogling me. Of course I'd have to split the fee with Robbie, whose six-foot height also draws attention, even as he keeps his eyes on the sidewalk. He stops walking and squares his cap so that it's flat enough to play chess on. Here's my stop. Good luck, Joe. Thanks, but keep some for yourself. He winks and slips down a narrow alley to use the back door of Bucks Bombs. Old Jin tells me things have changed for the worse since I was born. After good old President Hayes returned the South to home rule, Dems told colored people they should use the back alleys from then on, which pretty much sums everything. Fluffing the sleeves of my russet dress, which have lost their puff, and hanging like a pair of deflated lungs, I carry myself a block father to English's millinery. The shop stands between a, cast a candle maker and a seed store, meaning it can smell like a Catholic church or alfalfa depending on which way the wind blows. This morning, however, the air is still too crisp to hold the scent. The picture windows are as clear as our Lord's eyes, how I left them last night, with several mauve hats displayed. Mauve is having a moment. Instead of going through the front, I also trek to the back entrance. 
Folks care less about which door Chinese people use nowadays, compared with when the laborers were shipped in, shipped in to replace the field slaves after the war. Perhaps whites feel the same way about us as they do about ladybugs. A few are fine, but a swarm turns the stomach. Three boxes have been left by the back door, and I gather them in my arms, then enter. The sight of Lizzie trying on the newly finished, sensible hat I'd been designing stops me in my tracks. Why is she here? What, what is she doing here so early? She barely trapezes in by, at nine when the shop opens. It's not even a quarter past eight. Good morning. I set the boxes on our work table, which is already weighed down by reams of felt. The broadsides for the charity house race are rarely dry, and the orders are already flooding in. Fashion is supposed to rest on Lent, but God will surely make an exception for the event of the year. The proprietress will probably want me to stay late again or work during the lunch hour so she can sneak off to sip her coa cordial. Well, not without a raise, I won't. Mrs. English wants to speak to you, Lizzie says in her breathy voice. She smooths a hand down the rooster tail I pinned to the sensible hat with an eternity knot. Ringlets of strawberry blonde hair play peekaboo under the saucer brim. I remove my floor-length coat and black hat, one of the misfits that Mrs. English lets me purchase at a discount. This one made possible through Lizzie's clumsy hands. Then I tie on a lace apron. The velvet curtain separating the store from the workroom jerks to one side, and Mrs. English bustles in. There you are, she says in a haughty school mom's voice. I dust off my drab shop cap. Good morning, ma'am. I had an idea. What if instead of wearing these toadstools, we model our latest styles? See how fetching my sensible hat looks on Lizzie? Mrs. English frowns. Put the toadstools on, both of you. Yes, ma'am, Lizzie and I say in unison. I slip my cap over my head. I should ask now, before she asks me to stay late, so my request does not appear a hair-triggered reaction. I wipe my palms on my skirt. Mrs. English, Joe, I will no longer be requiring your services. I, I clamp my mouth shut when her words catch up to me. No longer required? I, I'm dismissed? I only need one shop girl, and Lizzie will do. Lizzie draws in a sharp breath. Her normally sleepy eyes open wide enough to catch gnats. Lizzie, open the packages. I hope the new boater blocks in one of them. Mrs. English wiggles her fingers. Yes, ma'am. Drawers clatter as Lizzie rummages for a knife. But, but, I turn my back on Lizzie and lower my pipes to whisper. Mrs. English, I trained her. I can felt a block type as, twi type as fa twice as fast as her. I'm never late. And you said I have an eye for color. Now, I can't lose this job. It took me almost two years to find the steady work after my last dismissal. And old Jim's meager wage as, as a groom isn't enough to sustain us both. We'll be back to living hand to mouth, tiptoeing on the edge of disaster. A bubble of hysteria works up my chest. I slowly breathe it out. At least we have a home. It's dry, warm, and rent-free. One of the perks of living secretly in someone else's basement. As long as you have a home, you have a place to plan and dream. The woman sighs, something she does often. Her great bosom has a personality of its own, at times riding high and at times twitchy and nervous, like when the mayor's wife pays a visit. Today's gusting tests the iron grip of her corset. Her rumory eyes squint up at me, towering over her. You make some of the ladies uncomfortable. Each of the syllables slapped me on the cheek. Uncomfortable. And mortification pours like molten iron from my face to my toes. But I'm good at my job. The solicitor's wife even called the silk knots I tied for her bonnet extraordinary. So what about me causes such offense? I wash regularly with soap, even the parts that don't show. I keep my black hair nearly braided and routinely scrub my teeth with a licorice root, thanks to Robbie. I'm not sluggish like Lizzie or overbearing like Mrs. English. In fact, I'm the least offensive member of our crew. It's because I'm... My hand flies to my cheek, dusky and smooth as the Asian steps. I know you can't help it. It's the lot you drew. She matches her round eyes with mine, which are just as round, but taper at the outside corners. But it's not just that. You're a sauce box. She squints at my cap, and I regret calling it a toadstool. 
You don't know when to keep your opinions to yourself. She draws back her head, causing her neck to bunch. Women want to be complimented. They do not want to be told they look washed out, square in the face, or pie-faced. If a hat made me look pie-faced, I would certainly want to know before I purchased it. Lizzie routinely gives opinions. Just last week, she told a woman with a lumpy head that maybe she should give up wearing hats entirely. Mrs. English only smiled. I'm about to give my opinion of her opinion, but that would only prove her point. I only wish to help them find the best fit. I try to keep a tight grip of my indignation, but my voice trembles. Well, the simple fact is, you are not the best fit here. Today will be your last day. Don't make this harder than it needs to be. I'm sure you'll have no trouble getting a job as a lady's maid or some such. A lady's maid? I suck in my breath. Now that would be a fall backward. Not that something like me can be choosy. Not a hatter's apprentice, of course. She jabs the pin in deeper. I have already talked to the 16 and they will not hire you. Despite being competitors, the 16 milliners that dress Atlanta's heads are tight as, hand, as hat bands. Something bangs on the door. But Lizzie's apologies for dropping the boater block sound far away. I have been blacklisted. Servants are routinely blacklisted when their services come to an end, even when they have done nothing to deserve it, except working their fingers to the breaking point each day, coming in early, leaving late, cleaning up other people's messes, painstakingly redoing their stitches. I can barely breathe. But, but, but I, I can't risk you spilling my secrets. The door chimes clang, and Mrs. English scurries back to the front. Tears gather in my eyes, and I press my sleeves to them before they fall. And I had one, and I had once thought Mrs. English kind for taking a chance on me. The proprietress pokes her head back into the workroom. Joe, the lady is asking for you. I swallow the lump in my throat. Me? No one has ever asked for me, and it's a little early for customers. The precise words were the Chinese girl, and so I had to give in my best shot. Don't dawdle. I dry my face and follow her into the shop. On the other side of the oak counter stands a woman in a gray suit with a modest bustle and a white blouse with a high collar. Narrow shoulders slope into an equally narrow neck, a pointed chin, and high cheekbones. Her, per her prematurely white hair is tied into a practical knot. I gasp. It's Mrs. Bell, my upstairs neighbor. Though we have kept our existence secret from the printer and his family, I have stolen glances at them through the print shop window. Her flannel gray eyes spread over me, and I can almost hear the underground walls of our house caving in. Outside, a whip cracks. A mule brays. And the last of my hopes seem to stampede away. And that was chapter one of The Downstairs Girl. Thank you very much for joining me today, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.